how many of you know somebody, don't put your hands up yet, who has suffered repeated abuse or abuse of some kind? For instance, verbal abuse, consistent bullying, for instance, putting people down, making fun of them. I know a uh, woman who to this day, in her 50s and 60s, uh, suffers with depression and a feeling that she's not worth anything because almost every day of her life as a little girl, she was told, you are stupid. You're too stupid to try that. She would come home and say, Mom, can I do such and such at school? She'd say, you're not smart enough to do that. And she heard that for 18 years. Do you know what she thinks today? She's stupid. And she has to battle that. But she has victory at times. That's abuse. I know of a mother who used to line her kids up every morning and say, let's see, which one do I love today? And they'd work all day long so that she'd pick one out and say, you're the one I love today. That's abuse. That's verbal abuse. That's emotional abuse. We know people who have been abused sexually, physically. Well, what's the difference between physical and sexual? Well, physical, uh, 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 sexual is physical, but there's other kinds of physical abuse. And we know people who have been beaten and pounded and, and uh, abused physically. We know people who have been abused uh, uh, in other ways. Our speaker today will probably bring up some of those. But how many of you know somebody, I'm not asking if you have, somebody who has been abused? How many of you know somebody who's been abused? For those of you on Facebook Live, everybody's hand in the room is up. Everybody's hand. Now here's the tragedy of it. Uh, a lot of preachers hardly recognize it or they believe in the dump truck method of handling it. Somebody comes to them or to their attention and they want to help them with abuse. And they dump a whole dump truck load of scriptures on the person and sort of like, okay, get out there. Face your emotional trauma and so forth. And I know a man who did that with uh, someone. He's a pastor of a good church and he's a good man. But the person on the way out the door said, well, when's my next appointment? And he said, I only counsel people one time. My counseling for you from now on will be Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night in church. Come and hear the sermons. Well, we are supposed to get counsel during church. But this person needed some special counseling. So a lot of preachers don't know what to do with this. They don't recognize the effects of abuse. And um, uh, so we have a counseling class. We also, Christian counseling class, we also have an advanced counseling class, and we, we do a little bit with this, but uh, we've had helping us here the last week and a half at the college, and she's getting ready to leave, uh, Mrs. Wendy Jo Householder, and she has a ministry called Hope for the Hurting, and she counsels people every day on the phone or through texting or through messaging, sometimes personal, personally. A uh, pastor in West Virginia a year ago uh, paid for her to come, had her stay in a hotel and counsel a young lady uh, in his church who needed a series of counseling sessions to begin to just get a hold of things that will give her victory. And uh, so we've had her here, and we asked her to speak in chapel. She is not preaching. <laughs> you had a woman preach in chapel. What are you talking about? Uh, I have had ladies speak in chapel on first aid. I've had ladies speak in chapel on CPR. I've had ladies speak in chapel in my 35 plus years of Bible college work on self-defense. And so take notes and see if there's anything here that you can get that will help you help somebody. You don't have to be a preacher to lead someone to Christ, right? You don't have to be a preacher to disciple a Christian, right? This is part of discipling someone. And she is uh, our teacher in our advanced counseling class, and she's going to speak on this. Just like I had Mrs. Marvin speak in our chapel on the library the other day, because she's a librarian. Okay? All right, Ms. Householder. Thank you, Dr. Miller. Um, and good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Um, as Dr. Miller has already stated, First of all, I was handing you a workout sheet. Um, worksheet. Counseling is, now you could tell.
take uh, a whole counseling course, a whole set of courses, but you're not going to learn everything you need to know about counseling in one chapel service. So this is really why behind it and some ideas. And it, you'll learn in counseling class, if you take the, the counseling course here, you will learn you are a counselor. You talk to your friends, you talk to your family members, you give them encouragement. That is what, what counseling is. Now, when people are in deep issues, they need some deeper counseling. But we're going to start with our responsibility um, with counseling they've used. 2 Timothy 4.2 says um, to preach the word out of season, in season, rebuke, reprove, out of order, reprove, rebuke, rebuke exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. Now needless to say, the very first thing anytime you're working with anyone is salvation. If they're not saved, then Amen. where do we even begin? So first of all, we need to either verify that they are saved, or we need to lead them to the Lord. And Amen. if they are not saved, and don't desire to get saved right now, that has happened, <laughs> you can still work with them and offer them as much help as possible with a heavy emphasis on salvation. Amen. And hopefully you'll be able to win that person to the Lord. Now, to reprove is to convince or convict. Now, if you think about this, these are the things that we need to do when we're, when we're talking with the abused, to rebuke them, to show them what they need to not do and, and why not to do it, to exhort, um, is to join in with obedience. So we're going to obey the Lord, and we're going to do it together. I'm going to be an example to you. I'm going to take you by the arm and do it with you. Long-suffering is patience. It's really easy to get... Impatient, you know, if you're helping someone clean the floor and they're not doing it right, it's easier to just do it. That's being impatient. We need to slow down and make sure they get what they need. And then doctrine, instruction, giving them biblical instruction. Um, we do need to listen. A lot of times somebody just needs to talk, 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 talk. And I spend a lot of time listening. If you listen, a lot of times you will hear um, underlying issues that they haven't told you yet. So they'll start off by saying, um, I have this catastrophic problem, and you just let them talk. And before long, they're either going way back, and this happened, and that happened, and I feel this way because... So just let them talk, be willing to listen, and sometimes they unravel things themselves while they're talking to you. So they'll start off saying, I don't understand why this is happening, and then by the end of the conversation, they're saying, well... I understand that this, this, and this, and they just now figured it out. So they need to talk. They have worked hard at suppressing the facts, suppressing those memories. So sometimes talking about it helps them to sort it all out. Types of abuse, and Dr. Moore just went over this, um, there can be physical, sexual, emotional, mental, verbal, and spiritual. Mm. Now spiritual is kind of a, a different one, but anyone who's trying to get gain by deceiving somebody on a spiritual level. And that does happen sometimes. A lot of times that happens in marriage. A lot of times a husband will use his spiritual authority in the house to mm -hmm. suppress That's instead right. of encourage. So that can happen in a lot of ways. What is not abuse? Sometimes um, an adult disciplining a child, we are supposed to, that's a biblical thing, discipline our children in love. Now if it's an angry thing and we're throwing things around and we're not being the example we should be, now we have stepped into discipline. Flirting between two people who are the same age, old enough to be flirting, um, just because someone flirted with you does not mean you've just been sexually abused. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there are struggles, and um, a lot of times it's easy for us to, to separate the struggles of someone who is abused when they're abused or later on. Sometimes abuse can be just a one-time event, and you might have been abused at work. Somebody put you through 10 minutes of abuse, or it could have been a lifelong thing. And that abuse, a lot of times, includes more than one abuse. It's emotional, and it's physical, whatever. Um, it's not usually just one abuse when it's a lifelong thing like that. So, 
A lot of times they are prisoners to their memories. But once they've gone through those memories and understand who caused the abuse and who's going to help them fix that abuse, they'll be able to get past it. Um, when I say past it, that doesn't mean forever. <laughs> for, um, for that step in the process. They, they might experience depression or anxiety. And those things, um, a lot of times, feel like a wet blanket <coughs> put on them. It's not something that they've chosen to do, but it comes on them because of their abuse. Grief. When you think about what grief is, grief is the loss of something. And anytime you've been abused, you've lost something. So um, even if it's emotional abuse or that spiritual abuse, you still have lost something that you could be grieving. Ministry. A lot of times people feel like they cannot be in the ministry. They can't serve the Lord at church because of the scars left from the abuse. The inferiority complex. They feel like they're not as good as everybody else. Um, now, if this is happening during childhood, a lot of times the ability to be a good child, to be a good student, to be a good Christian, they feel inadequate in every way, quite often. Um, a lot of times that depends on how it's dealt with in their family unit. So, in some families, no matter what kind of abuse it is, it's a denial. No, that didn't happen, not in our family, we're not talking about that. Or, it's over the top sympathy. Oh, you poor thing, and their you know, mom's telling every family member or every visitor that comes through the door, and that child learns, I get attention because of this. So now that child wants to tell everybody. That's an unusual thing. Usually, when someone has been abused, they want to keep that to themselves. They want to hide it. They don't want anyone to know about it. But the person who latches on and wants to develop a relationship with every single person that comes along, just long enough to tell them, but then they still want to be arm's length. It's not very often, but it does happen. And again, it depends on how their parents dealt with it when they were children. Mm -hmm. But then that is carried on into um, adulthood, the ability to be a good spouse, to raise their children, to serve the Lord themselves, to teach their children to serve the Lord. All of that is affected by, I feel inadequate. I'm damaged goods. I'm not going to be able to do this. And then there's fear. Um, there is the fear of triggers. A trigger can be a smell or a sound or an atmosphere. Um, I know one lady shared with me the smell of bacon. And I, I had been teasing her, you know, bacon is a good smell. This is, they could make perfume. It smells like bacon. It would work for most of us. <laughs> it's a good thing. But um, for her, because while her mom was cooking the bacon is when her abuse usually happened. And so for her to smell bacon wasn't a good thing. And that was something she had to consider if someone said, can I take you out to eat? She didn't want to go where she was going to have to smell bacon, so she did not go to breakfast time. Um, sounds, you know, depending on what sounds took place. I've seen people react whenever they hear a child crying at the store. You know, I've seen them react and they'll, you know, turn sharply and they're watching and they're just scared to death that child's being abused because of the sounds they heard as a child. Fear, fear of others finding out and judging. Now this one I love because it's kind of a two-sided coin. They're afraid, and they'll tell you this, well, I'm afraid people will find out and they're gonna judge me and then they're gonna know that I'm damaged goods, that um, I'm not capable of doing the things that I should be able to do because I'm carrying this burden. And at the same time, the reason their friends, coworkers, family doesn't know is because they're not carrying it out there. So what is their family member thinking of them? A lot of times, the very person who's been abused is very sweet, very kind, very gentle. When most people would say, wow, she's really a good Christian. Most people have no idea. So what are the chances that everybody's judging you? Um, so we start with the Lord loves you and has a plan. Amen. Now we know the first thing is we want to get them saved. But John 10, 10 says, The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Amen. When someone who has been abused reads a verse in the Bible, a lot of times they, in, they insert, there it goes, The thief cometh not, but to, for to steal and to destroy, to kill and to destroy. 
I am come that they, everybody but me, everyone who hasn't been abused, everyone who isn't damaged yet, might have life. And that they, those who haven't been abused, those who aren't damaged, might have it more abundantly. But that's not what the scripture says. And this is as relevant for me as it is for you, as it is for the person who hasn't been abused. The Lord came, not that we might just have life, but that we'll have it more abundantly. Amen. This is for the abused person as well. So first I try to get someone who has been abused and who is hurting to recognize the enemy. One of my favorite verses, Ephesians 6, 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I love studying that verse because it really represents a lot of Satan's workers. We're not just, we don't have just one um, satanic being attached to us to follow us around and antagonize us whenever we're attacked. Uh, quite often we're attacked by a throng. So it's not just um, flesh and blood. And that's where most people start off with, well, my mom did, or my sister did, or my uncle did. But who was behind that? Why did that happen? Um, so we need to recognize that Satan is our enemy. And when I taught middle school, I used to say to my students in the morning, who is number one most powerful? And of course they would say God. And then I would say, but who is else more powerful than us? Less powerful than God, but more powerful than us? Satan. We don't have the ability, we can't fight him, but the Lord can. God wants your body as it is. Romans 12, 1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. This is just the most basic thing, but for someone who's been abused, they are so self-conscious about their body and the abuse that took place, no matter which department of abuse we're talking about, which kind of abuse, they still feel like, I can't give this to God. This is damaged to us. We want to give our best to the Lord. And we do. We want to dress our best for the Lord when we go to his house. We want to give our very best gifts to the Lord. But he says right here, he wants us to give him our body. He knows what our bodies have been through. He knows what we've had to deal with. And yet, he wants us to give our bodies as a living sacrifice. So, even if you've been abused, that's where we start. God wants you. God loves you. Amen. He designed you. He wants you to give yourself as a living sacrifice. God does have a perfect will for you. And Amen. I don't know why, but when we've been damaged, we think that we've stepped out of that, and God does not have a perfect will for us. Romans 12, 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Um, when we've been abused, there are a lot of things in our mind that we need to get out of our mind. So, renewing, transforming our mind, be ye transformed. We can be transformed by the renewing of our mind. That is God's perfect will for us. That's God, God's perfect will for us even if we've been damaged, even if someone's hurt us, even if we're walking around with a gazillion things in our head we would like to not be in our head. Mm -hmm. Still, God wants to transform us mm -hmm. by the renewing of your mind. And... Um, the way we do that is with his word, and we're going to see that in a minute. So obedience. Everything hinges on obedience. The first step of obedience is getting saved. Amen. Um, James 1.22 says, But be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. When we are hearers of the word, we are deceiving ourselves. If that's all that we do, we're, we're deceiving ourselves. And we see that at Reformers Unanimous. Um, we'll have people come, and they'll tell their family, I'm working the program, I'm going every Friday, and they're not working the program. They're not doing the challenges, they're not reading their Bible, they're not studying their Bible, they're not memorizing verses, so they're not really working the program. Um, if we will do what the Lord has shown us to do, and that's why whenever we're working with someone, we don't say, here's a list, do all of this. This is everything God's convicted me of, so here it is, you do it. We don't do that. They need to read through God's word just like you did and become obedient to the very first thing the Lord shows them and then be obedient to the second thing and then be obedient to the third thing. If we will be doers, obedient, doers of the word and not hearers only, then we won't be deceiving ourselves. 
Psalms 1-2 says, But his, this is referring about the blessed man, his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. So what are we meditating on? If we want to be the blessed man, whether we've been abused or whether we haven't, the abused person wants to be blessed as, as well as the rest of us, we must meditate on God's word day and night. So if it's day and it's night, when is it that we're not going to meditate on God's word? Mm. What's in between? <laughs> Nothing. Day and night. Meditate on his word. Um, the blessed man's delight, his delight. So not a chore. It's his delight. He enjoys doing this. And we would enjoy it. If we got the blessings from it, we would enjoy it. Um, so what are you going to meditate on? And Isaiah 40, verse 31 says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not be faint. This verse, although we find it very comforting and very encouraging, if you have been abused, this verse is amazing. It's more than just comforting. Think about someone who's been abused and what's going on in their mind that is totally draining of their strength. They just feel down, depressed. Oh, I need to do this. I need to do that. Just the basic things. It just sucks the life out of them. So, they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. Did you notice it doesn't say that they who wait upon the Lord, their counselor, will renew their strength for them? They will renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as eagles. Have you ever seen an eagle fly? That's, that's some incredible time with the Lord right there. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Ephesians 4.23 says, And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now verse 22 talks about putting off the old man. And verse 24 talks about putting on the new man. And those of you who have a laundry basket, you know that yesterday's clothes are not what you want to be wearing today. Amen. We need to put on new. Um, so this is what we want to do. Be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That was Ephesians 4.23. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So if you think about this verse, the same power in the Lord's salvation, the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, is the same power he's going to live through, through me. He's going to do this for me, but Christ liveth in me. So when I'm talking to someone who's been abused and I'm trying to tell them, God can renew you. His word will renew you. His word will strengthen you. They often feel like, oh, I'm not going to be able to do that. And that's an easy one. No, you're not. But Christ will do it for you. Psalm 119, verse 114 says, Thou art my hiding place and my shield. I hope in thy word. We, we do have hope, and it's in his word. Um, sometimes it's hard to motivate someone to spend the amount of time in God's word that they need to in order to get the help that they need. Because they'll want to do, you know, well, just let me get this little two-minute devo out of a booklet or something. That's good. That's helpful. But they really need to renew their mind. They really Amen. need to spend some time in God's Word. So um, that's where our hope is. That's where we want to anchor our hope. Now, I can't take a big old long list of things and tell the abused person, start here and then do this and then do this and then do this and then do this. Because everyone's journey is different. And the Lord is going to show them different things that they need to work on. And so they need to work on things as the Lord shows them to them. So what do you do? You start with, um, first of all, ask the Lord, what is it that I should be dealing with next? You don't have to deal with all of it at one time. Daniel 2.47 says, the king, we're talking about Nebuchadnezzar, answered unto Daniel and said, of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods, and a Lord of kings, and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. So, because Daniel was able to reveal the secret, Nebuchadnezzar recognized this as his God. His God revealed this secret. His God knew what we didn't know, and, it, and he showed it to Daniel. Well, Daniel had already set the king up. He had already given him the promise that the Lord is the one who's going to give us the secret. 
back in Daniel 2.28, he said, but there is a God in heaven that revealed secrets. So we see that King Nebuchadnezzar was able to give credit to the Lord because Daniel had already told him this is where it is. We can ask the Lord. Anything that his word tells us to do, we can ask him questions about. So do what we do know to do. James 4.17 says, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not to him it is sin. What is it that you do know to do? So when I'm talking with someone who is addicted, um, in Hebrews 10 it says not forsaken the assembly. We already know we should be in church. So what is it that we should do? We know the good to do is to be in church. We already know to be in God's word. We learn that from the blessed man. Psalm 1 also tells us to choose godly friends. When people are really struggling, quite often they need to look around and see who are they sharing their time with. And Psalm 5 tells us about our prayer life, starting off first thing in the morning, getting with the Lord. And then, of course, in Mark 16, to be a witness. So once we are, and this isn't the cure-all, it's just doing the basics, just doing what the Lord has told all of us to do. And we're not exempt because we have been damaged. We're not exempt because... We don't feel adequate. God wants us to do what we know to do. So the basics. Just get busy with the basics and then ask the Lord, what is it that you want me to do? Now, if you're the abused person is talking to a counselor and you're going through hashing three memories and a lot of times it comes out not in chronological order, it's pieces, parts, and you kind of have to put it back together, it'll reveal to them things that the counselor will see needs to be worked on. So that's a good reason to see a counselor. Um, but one tool that we do have is Restored Living and Loving After Abuse by Dr. Don Woodard. And what I like about this book, when Brother Woodard emailed me and said, would you please read this book and let me know what you think? I fell in love with the teddy bear. He literally says, the fellow who took the teddy bear, and he gets back into God's word. So for years, people have said, isn't there something that I can read? And the books that I have come across that I've read are not books that somebody could read if they had been abused. It's too emotional for them. So rather than dragging you through all of the stories, there are some accounts, testimonies in the back. He puts the teddy bear in there. So every single time he's, he mentions the teddy bear, the person who's been abused, what do they think? They, they know exactly what happened with them so they're not being dragged back through it. Uh, now, if you work all the way through this book, by the time you get to the end, you can probably read those testimonies and it's not a problem. But if not, you know they're there, you don't have to read them. Um, the very first chapter in the book is Somebody Does Love You, and he talks about how God's love will help you through this in John 4, and he uses the woman at the well to um, explain that. He does a really good job. And then chapter two is A New Journey, and this encourages you to understand that the Lord does not want you to be where you were. He does have a plan for you. He has a blessed plan. Amen. For you. Yes, he does. <clears throat> and chapter three is taking back my life. The thief, again, he uses John two. The thief cometh not but to steal, to kill, to destroy, but to have life more abundantly. And then chapter four is past, present, future. What can I change? So being able to sift through and see what can be changed, what cannot be changed, obviously what has happened can't be changed. But I, I can have a future. I can be transformed. Amen. Again, he uses Romans 12. And he explains it very well. The power of forgiveness, Ephesians 4, be kind one to another, tenderhearted, um, forgiving one another. He, and he explains the importance of forgiveness, how we are hung up by our lack of forgiveness. It, it holds us back. But we are blessed when we do forgive because that's obedience to the Lord. And he shows us how to do that. And then chapter 6 is questions from the heart, answers from God. This has got to be probably one of the most favorite um, chapters. It is full of all the questions everyone asks. And he gives us good biblical answers to those tough questions. And then chapter 7, trust God and his word. Trust. Sorry, trust is a chapter. He teaches us to trust God in his word, the source of healing and restoration, to guide you into the path of living and loving again. And, again, without his word, where to begin? 
Confronting Giants, Chapter 8, Proof that the Lord will help you fight the giants in your life. Amen. And he talks about David and Goliath. And I love that um, the example that he uses there goes into Chapter 9, Prepare for Warfare. And David prepared with the tools that the Lord gave him, but the Lord supplied the power. Amen. In order to win that battle. And he'll do the same thing for us. Chapter 10, self-value. Our value actually lies in God's sacrificed son. So often we will think of our inabilities, and that's not where our value is. Our value is in the Lord. And chapter 11, written on your heart. The Lord wants to write on your heart a new story and erase the old story. What was written on your heart. And then chapter 12 is pour out your heart. We must let go so we can gain. And he talks about Matthew 11. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. That is where our rest is. And then chapter 13 is hope, a living hope, which is Christ. He is also our anchor. And then chapter 14 is personal peace, the importance of peace and the steps to take in order to achieve the peace that is promised in God's word. And he uses Isaiah 26.3 to explain that. And then chapter 15 is beauty for ashes, moving past the ashes of your past. And that's where everybody wants to be. It's in your hands. And then chapter 16, again, is those testimonies that I was telling you about. And they're good testimonies to see that the Lord has rescued people from their abuse. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Ms. Householder. The uh, author of the book, Dr. Don Woodard, was watching today on Facebook Live, and hello, Dr. Woodard, I appreciate you, and I think in this book somewhere, there's a recommendation by me somewhere in this book, is that right? I think so. Yeah, I think so. And uh, if he didn't take me out of there, <laughs> we're friends, and he abuses me. Oh, no, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but anyways, uh, I want to say something for the people in our class here today and the people watching on Facebook Live. Now, if you just jumped in in the middle, and our viewership was very good, and uh, there were a lot of people who counsel abused folks. Pastors' wives were watching. Pastors were watching. And uh, then there were just people that are our friends uh, with me or with the college who were watching. But maybe you jumped in the middle, and you say, Dr. Miller has a woman preaching in chapel. Well, obviously, she did not preach. And our chapel is for three reasons. My chapels have been for three reasons for years. Information. We make announcements. For instance, today is November 1st. Your school bills are due. So forth. Information. Number two. Inspiration. Preachers who will preach to us and from the Word of God inspire us to do greater things for God. And then lastly, indoctrination. That's teaching. And that can be everything, like I said, from... Uh, Mrs. Marvin teaching us how to use and get more out of our college library. She spoke. In a, a few weeks, Lord willing, Mrs. England is going to teach about some music things that Bruce Miller can't teach about music. Uh, things that I know, but she can actually show it to you. She can demonstrate it to you on the piano. And uh, so it's for indoctrination. Doctrine, the Word of God. Um, uh, what we believe, why we believe it, we would not have a lady do that. Uh, so don't get all out of joint about this. Um, now, uh, people who get out of joint about this send their kids to college and they don't care if a woman teaches them, uh, a woman teaches their young people speech class, <laughs> even young men. So uh, thank you for sharing this with us. I want to point out a couple things that Wendy Jo said, and then I want to say more about this book, and then I want to give an assignment to you students. Um, Wendy Jo uh, mentioned that we start with salvation. Can you help somebody if they don't get saved? Well, let's see. One, two of you have been in our counseling classes. You can help them to a degree, but they can only go so far if they don't get saved. Mm -hmm. So you can help them to a degree. Uh, number two, our goal is not that they become dependent. You heard me saying, you heard her say that you can't give it all to them in one counseling session usually. But uh, So it's going to take follow-up visits, but our goal is not that they become dependent on us. I know some people who the, the counselor actually wants them to be dependent on him or her, him or her. And uh, that's not our goal. 
Our goal is that they can become dependent solely on the Lord and help other people through these types of things. In 2 Corinthians, uh, the Bible talks about God letting us go in chapter 1 through experiences, and he's the God of all comfort who comforts us in our trials and tribulations so we can comfort others with the same comfort wherewith we were comforted of God. So if we go through an experience, God wants us to get victory. She shared Romans 10, 10, B. Brother Woodard shares Romans 10, 10, B, the abundant life. God wants us to have the abundant life, but he, he wants us to help other people who don't have the abundant life get the abundant life. So he lets us go through these things so we can help other people uh, through these things. I want to point out another thing, too. When Brother Pete preaches here, or Brother Kyle preaches here, or others who will be coming through here, we always are thankful to mention that they're graduates of Atlantic Coast Baptist College, and Miss Householder is a graduate of Atlantic Coast Baptist College also. Now, students, here's your assignment, and then I want to say something about this book. Don't check out on me before I say something about this book. Uh, students, write this down. Here's an assignment. Uh, next week, next week by Wednesday, next week by Wednesday, I want you to turn in this handout. I saw some of you. Man, David, he's got his front page all filled in. I want you to turn in this handout. I saw some of you, and I'm not, I'm not being mean to you, but you didn't have anything written down here. I want you to review this material, uh, just like in your journal, your daily journal, you write down sermon notes and review those. I want you to review this lesson material because it's for you to help other people with. And every one of you students said, I know somebody who's been abused. Okay? So uh, I want you to turn it in. Now, if you're, uh, here's a good way to do it. We're going to post today's lesson. <clears throat> Go back and watch it again. And if you have to, stop it. Write down the notes for that section. <clears throat> and it's okay, students, for you this time to share your homework with someone else. Uh, hey, Dave, I saw you wrote a lot. Can I, can I see your notes? Just make sure you get them back, Dave. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you're a good Christian, this time you'll let them see the notes. You will not get expelled for cheating this time. It's not cheating, all right? It's helping somebody and sharing. So that's your assignment, Wednesday. Turn this in, please. And uh, this is not exhaustive. She said we can't cover everything in one lesson. This is just to prick your awareness. There's a problem. We can help them solve the problem, and God will solve the problem if they're doers of the word, not hearers only. Now, Dr. Woodard has written, I want to talk about this book now, Restored Living and Loving After Abuse. This title goes against what the world teaches about counseling and abuse. When it's found that someone is the victim of something as terrible, a child, something as terrible as sexual abuse, and it hits the news, the first thing you hear is, they're scarred for lives. Th the life. They'll never get over this. That's a lie of the devil. Because remember, he wants to destroy and steal. He wants to steal their future. But God came to give us the abundant life. We can get over it, but not if we bury it. But we can get over it, okay? So just his title smacks the world's premise that they're scarred for life. They can't get over it right in the face because it says restored, living and loving after abuse. All right? I love his title. Uh, Dr. Woodard has written a lot of books, and uh, several of them, are excellent for counseling. One is on grief. Uh, uh, not just grief, but it's called When the Will of God is a Bitter Cup. I use it to help people who are grieving over something. But it's when things in life, you had to experience something right smack dab in the will of God, but it's a bitter cup to swallow. Uh, and that's an excellent book. But uh, you can get this book if you go to... Uh, the title of it by Dr. Don Woodard under Ambassador International. You can look it up. Uh, we're going to post it on there. Uh, you can also get it if you happen to see Mrs. Householder. A number of you are going to see her at the Gospel Light Baptist Church Ladies Conference uh, this uh, Friday and Saturday in Walkertown, North Carolina. She'll have this book on your table. Is that right? You can get it there on the table. 
<clears throat> and I'm sorry, Brother Witter, you and I are not welcome at the ladies' conference. We've got to trust her to get this book out. <laughs> and then uh, you could also get it by writing us, but really I'd rather, I sell it on my table, and I go through it just like this, but I'd rather do it, uh, have you get it through Dr. Woodard himself, and we'll put that up on there for you. Every preacher, every preacher's wife, every assistant pastor, assistant pastor's wife, every Christian who's grown in the Lord ought to have this because, again, you are going to run into somebody who has been abused. And this book will help you. You, you say, I don't know what to tell people who have been abused. Why don't you work through this book with them? Chapter by chapter by chapter. You'll grow, they'll grow, and this is a great book. Thank you, Dr. Woodard, for writing this book and publishing this book. And uh, I'm glad I have this tool on my table when I go to churches. Thank you so much. Now, I think I've covered everything I wanted to cover. Students, do you have any questions that you want to ask uh, at this time? <clears throat> I wasn't expecting any, but I want to give you the chance. Now, uh, if, uh, if you wanted to ask some. All right. Uh, those are all, that's all we have for chapel today, except a few remarks I want to make to our students when we're dismissed in prayer. So let's bow our heads. Thank you again, Ms. Householder, uh, for this uh, lesson that we got today. God, this is just touching the tip of the iceberg. And we can go deeper with Dr. Woodard's book, Restored, Living and Loving After Abuse. But we've been made aware of some things today. We've been made aware that the devil wants to destroy a person's life, their future, their goals, their aspirations. Lord, I know from counseling that students come to Bible college who have been abused sometimes. Lord, I'm thinking of a young lady who was sexually abused from the time she was six till she was 14 every Friday and Saturday night by an uncle and his friends. And yet she is living a successful Christian life today because people were able to help her and you stepped in and helped her. Lord, we also know that people can even forgive the ones who abuse them. And these are things covered in that book or mentioned by Miss Householder today. God, help us to take these things, like so many things we learn in chapel, a little bit about. And in our ministries, now and in the future, help us to remember that you can save everybody and who come to you by faith in Christ, and you can deliver everybody, and you can give the fruit of the Spirit to everybody, even people who lost their love, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, who uh, lost their joy, but the fruit of the Spirit is joy, who through abuse lost their peace, but the fruit of the Spirit is peace, love, joy, peace, and on down through the line. God, I pray that you would use this short chapel time to help some people in their lives or help some people help some people. For Jesus' sake, so some Christians quit being spiritual, damaged, crippled Christians and become giants for you. In Jesus' name, we ask this. Amen.